It always looks neat when you ask someone who's made a vocational choice to describe the journey because I have the privilege of putting it in some sort of logical order. Um, and then I have the confidence of knowing the decision's already been made and I'm living out the Lord's will. But the reality is, is if you look back at how did this happen or how did I hear God's voice, it can be really messy. And just kind of that encouraging word of it's okay if wherever you are in your life, it feels messy. Um, but that's, that's often part of, of God working through us to reveal his will. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota. I'm the youngest of three children, um, raised in a very loving Catholic home where our Catholic faith was just in that sense, that bedrock. Um, going to Sunday mass was very important. Praying together before meals was always done to the degree that one of my best friends who wasn't raised in any family knew the bless us the Lord prayer um, like anyone else. And even to this day, when she comes over, she's like, of course we pray at your house. It's just what we do. Um, but uh, at the same time, there was a lot about the faith that went unsaid. And so while my, my parents were faith-filled, it didn't necessarily permeate the home conversations. And so when I was 13, I kind of attribute that as a, a real moment in letting the Catholic faith that was given to me um, become something that was a little bit more important. And it happened through um, some friends. I started participating in an after-school Bible study and um, became more drawn to the fact that the word of God really is living and effective. So I'd say my prayer life started in earnest at the age of 13, although the sacramental life was already given grace, I was not really aware of how to access those graces or to maybe go deeper in my faith. Um, by the time I got to high school, so I did have a prayer life, was going to a public high school, but I had a lot of questions about, is, is God real? And am I Catholic just because my family's Catholic? And, and if God is really real, and if being Catholic is real, um, shouldn't my life reflect that differently? Like if what I believe is true, that should really change how I act um, with others. And so I just tons of questions. And I remember doing the dishes with my mom and she's hearing me kind of pour out all these, you know, do you believe in God? And is all this really true? And are we just, anyway, she listens patiently. And uh, I remember her just kind of saying um, that these are questions we need to ask ourselves and that she really respected the fact that, um, that I did want to ask questions. And I remember this moment of feeling like my mom was giving me permission to, to question. Um, but at the same time, she had said, you know, as long as you live at home, um, you need to attend mass with us and, and continue to, to live at the way we've taught you. But if you need to ask these questions. So I, I actually did quite a bit of like high school kind of searching um, in terms of I would attend church services with my Protestant friends. I attended a synagogue with a Jewish friend. I just, I wanted to know kind of what made us different. And through all that, I realized I didn't know a lot about being Catholic. I didn't know what made us different. And so then when the time came to pick a, a Catholic school, I was at mass one day and I looked up after communion and I saw a young man wearing a, a sweatshirt that said the Catholic University of America. And I thought, huh, that, that sounds like a Catholic school. It has Catholic in the name. And through the God's providence, um, I ended up visiting and just loved it. And so uh, at college, I, I, moved, I moved away to, to Washington, D.C., attended the Catholic University of America, where they had a wonderful liberal arts program. And I was studying French in secondary education. And I really just kind of had this simple prayer of, Lord, if you're real, if all the, you know, the Catholic Church teaches is true, will you just show yourself to me and help me to know it? Because I feel like I don't know my faith. And if you're real, I want to know you and serve you. But if you're not, I don't want to fake it. I didn't know exactly how to phrase it, but that was kind of the essence of the prayer. And then really through the next four years in college, he just opened my, um, opened my eyes um, and really my mind as well and my heart to just get to know him and the gift of the sacraments. And I, I got to study more in depth the faith that was lived in my home, but not necessarily understood by me. Um, and so I, I'd say the seeds of a voca vocation, it starts in the family. Um, but I'd say my ability to hear God's word and act on it came through partly through that intellectual experience of know, knowing that even if my emotional base was going to fluctuate, I knew God was real. I knew God had a plan for my life. I knew it was a good plan. And I knew that the greatest joy would be in following his, his will. Um, how did I know? I would say knowing kind of comes through stages, right? Um, scripture talks about how we will know um, the tree by their fruits, right? And so the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, right? Paul lists so many of them. 
And so in our own lives, we can even just ask in today, how am I doing God's will today? Well, is there a fruit of peace? Is there the fruit of patience? Um, and when we see these fruits at work in our life, we can start to see, yes, I'm living in accord with God's will. So um, there were some moments in college when I was part participating in a women's discernment group where there was just a peace in asking the question of would I even be happy as a, as a religious sister? Um, and kind of this interest of, I actually, I think that would be a really fulfilling life. And um, it, not unlike those who need to date before getting engaged, it's important when considering a religious vocation to um, increase, of course, consistency in prayer life, but also to visit communities. So I did take time to visit some other religious communities and see how did they live community life? How is their prayer life? What was their apostolate? What was the charism of the founder? And I didn't really know what the word charism meant. I didn't know the questions to ask, but being present with religious communities started to just teach me a little bit more so that if I was being called to, to religious life, I would know more about it. And if, if I was being called to marriage, it wouldn't be because I was running away from religious life. I think in, in any vocation, you can't let fear and running away be a deciding factor. <laughs> For my freshman year in college, I, I met the Dominican sisters when they came up for the March for Life. And um, uh, a lovely young woman had put these posters all over the dorm where I was living, like, come meet the sisters. That didn't really interest me. But the line that said free pizza, I was like, I'm going to be there. I don't, I don't know many college kids who have a lot of money for food. So I was really excited about the free meal. And I thought, I don't mind having dinner with the nuns if that gets me some food. So I went. The pizza was really good. I, I have this, you know, distinct memory. And they, they showed a little vocation video, maybe eight, eight minutes in length, and we could ask questions. And this permeating thought of, huh, sisters still exist. And at least from this video, they look like happy people. And I found that immediately attractive. Um, and so in a sense, there was just kind of this fascination of a life that I kind of thought was extinct or non-existent because I did not have much exposure to religious life growing up. Um, that there, there was an intrigue. So I started going on retreats when possible. I was able to do some retreats with the Little Sisters of the Poor who are very near Catholic University. And they also have the Servants of the Lord and the Virgin of Matara right there. Um, and then the Ann Arbor Dominicans. I had a sister in one of my philosophy classes. And so it was just a real great exposure to religious life and, and different kinds of religious life. And um, I guess what I found is, so the attraction to religious life was strong. And one of my biggest conflicts is that I took a look at my life and how I grew up and I really felt like I didn't have enough of what I considered to be essential check marks. And so I kind of thought you always had to be very faithful to be a sister or you, you had to know the Bible better or you need to have memorized prayers. I mean, I was at a time in college where I was learning a lot about the faith, but I couldn't have told you um, what the Sermon on the Mount was. I couldn't have listed the mysteries of the rosary. I probably would have gotten nervous if I had been asked to lead um, the Apostles' Creed by myself. Just things that I knew in general, but I didn't feel this sense of, um, now I can't be religious because sisters are people who have it together. And while I'm interested in God, I don't have it together. And so um, the fear had to do not so much with the vocation, but with an inadequacy. And, and realizing along the journey, as I talked to more priests that I trusted or religious, kind of being told again and again that our vocation isn't our gift to God, right? Sometimes we think I'll do something great for the church. or like, they really need me because religious life is like declining in numbers. Um, and the reality is religious life is a gift of God to the faithful. Um, and so we, we really, it's all a gift. And so if he's calling me or calling you, calling someone to religious life, it's not so much that you're going to go change the world. Um, it's that he's going to change you, right? He's going to make you more the saint that he's calling you to be. So I, I'd say the hardest part about any vocation is your vocation is to lead you to sanctity, to holiness. And holiness comes through self-knowledge. And self-knowledge takes vulnerability. And so in the journey, I had to discover things about myself that were maybe um, harder, harder just to acknowledge and recognize. And so those are painful moments. Um, but then you get to the other part and that's where that peace comes from, right? The peace of, okay, Lord, I do feel vulnerable and I don't feel holy enough, but that's not a good enough excuse. Um, okay. So let me advance the story a little bit too. So I, so all through college, there's this interest and I do, I, I am thinking about religious life. Um, but by the time I graduate college, I still didn't have any sense of, of what order to join or if I was supposed to join or even when, and I did have to pay back college loans immediately. Right. 
And I remember initially looking at Catholic U, I received some initial scholarships. And when I did the math, I was like, okay, I, you know, this is going to be challenging, but I want to make an investment in education. And my mom and I had talked about it one time and she told the story of my, uh, my grandfather who was a farmer and he invested um, in a combine at a time when it was financially really expensive. And he said, you invest in things you care about. He invested in his farm. Some people invest in houses. And she, and she looked at me, she goes, you're investing in education and it might take you your whole life to pay it back. But if this is where you think God wants you to go, we'll help, we'll help you. And basically then we'll sign the loans with you because they couldn't, they couldn't cover it for me, you know? So I, I worked, I worked all through college, got scholarships, but even that it didn't add up to kind of covering bills. So right out of college, it's like, I need a job. And I had seen that the Dominican sisters were opening a new high school in Virginia and the thought of Christian, okay, new high school, they're going to need a whole new staff because it's a new building. I had a teaching degree in French um, and secondary education. And so I applied and got the job and it was a great fit because I was able to do right away what I'd studied and loved, which was being with people, educating and teaching. Um, and because the Dominican sisters were at that high school, I could kind of vocationally discern very closely without any real commitment because I saw the sisters every day, which is huge. And I remember being called into the principal's office one time. And as a new teacher, I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done wrong? I'm in the principal's office. And the sister at the time, she just looked at me and she said, so where are you in your vocation journey? I had shared with her that I'd been on a vocation retreat. And I said, oh, well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, may maybe. And I didn't, didn't have the right words to say, it scares me. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And she said just some really helpful things. And, and she looked at me and she goes, um, don't be afraid to give God your youth. Um, and so if, if you think God is calling you and you don't really have any reasons of saying no, um, if you make that leap, if you start, he'll make it clear. And kind of this idea of either you would, you would just kind of naturally show me that path or there'd be roadblocks. And I thought that that was really great advice because I was making excuses as if I needed to be on a different timeline or maybe I'll work for five years and then consider. And the reality was, is I didn't know, I didn't know what to do, but I wasn't doing anything. And that's really not a way to advance life, like to just not do anything. So um, I started, I emailed the vocation director and just kind of said, what, what would be the next step? I've already been on a retreat. And, um, and so that kind of got me the courage to be a little bit more proactive. And what I've learned too, is God never forces this invitation to religious life on someone. It, it's really, and in a sense, we take an initiative and then the Lord and the community kind of helps um, encourage and walk, walk through, I guess. Yeah. The, the hard parts is kind of knowing like, what's the next step? Cause there's no real roadmap to figuring out God's will. It's, it's through prayer. Um, it's so good to talk to people who know you and who want your good because they can give advice that's a little less emotionally biased um, and can help see, oh no, you look happy doing this and kind of affirm where our emotions, while helpful and good in themselves, um, might not always be leading us in the truth. And so we need to kind of weigh what's my emotional response versus what, what is objectively good and are my emotions in line with reality? I knew that I had a lot of college debt and I was fine paying it back. I was on about a 30 year payment plan. Because as a teacher, I made enough, um, you know, to get groceries and rent and car payments. I wasn't really living in luxury, but when you stretch out a plan over 30 years, you can do it. Um, but all of a sudden, there was a thought of, if I'm supposed to enter religious life, I really don't think I can wait on the 30-year plan. So how do, I, how do I pay this off? So I reached out to the Mantra Ecclesia Fund for Vocations, and I just kind of asked, how does this work? And they were um, really encouraging and basically said, step one for in my case would be, I need to actually be accepted by the community because if I'm not accepted, I can't even apply for the grant. But then this felt tricky because I thought, well, can the community of good conscience accept me if I come with this much debt because they can't in their vow of poverty assume my debt. So I, there was a really vulnerable moment when I was talking with um, one of the sisters who helped with the vocation process. And I, I really just said, I said, this is kind of embarrassing. And I, I, I don't know if I made some poor life choices, but I, I basically owe over a hundred thousand dollars in educational debt. Um, and she kind of, she listened to my story and talked about it. And she just, she smiles and she goes, God is rich, right? Don't let money be an issue of vocation. She goes, if, if God wants you, he's going to make it work and you don't, you don't worry. But she said, but at the same time, you got to do your part. So um, she encouraged me to apply. And I shared with the sisters that um, 
if, if I was accepted, I, I intended to pay off my debt kind of before entering. And so there was kind of this expressed acknowledge of we'll process your application, but, um, but like, you need to work, you need to work on the hundred thousand dollar of debt. So I was like, I don't know, it doesn't work. So by God's grace, uh, I received a, a phone call in August of 2009, um, that I was accepted to enter. And so then from August of 2009 for the next full year, it was okay, Lloyd, how are you going to make a miracle happen? Um, and it started, I remember first, obviously even sharing with my family and they were, they were supportive in the way of they saw how happy I was, but I could tell there was a sense of this might be hard because in helping her raise the money, we're losing our daughter. You know, there's, 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 it's bittersweet. Um, and so what a testament of a family's love of my parents' love, uh, my, my older brother and my older sister, huge supporters, even if they didn't necessarily know what this would look like for our family dynamic. Um, so my grandmother was the first to be a sponsor of mine and she sent, um, she sent a huge, huge check in the mail of all things. And I open up this sweet card from grandma and I had to read the numbers twice. Um, she had given $13,000 and basically had said, you know, if, if you had gotten married or done other things, we would have contributed over the years and I want to do my part. And so it's just overwhelming of, wow, okay, that's wonderful. I talked to my boss and I said, I need to get a second job. And she worked out um, a coaching stipend for me so that I ended up being uh, an extra coach at school so I could make a little bit more money. Okay, so that takes off another chunk. Um, I asked an aunt and uncle that lived nearby if I could move in with them, even though I didn't know them as well, we were a family. And I explained I'd like to move in so that I could start paying off my loans more aggressively. And I'd like to not pay rent, but I can pay for groceries. And, you know, my aunt, she said, well, I have to talk to my husband, but I'll get back to you. And they were about to go on a trip. So I figure I'll hear back from her in a week. And an hour later, the phone rings and she said, my husband was ecstatic. We think it's going to be great for us. Why don't, why don't you come and live with us? So I now had free rent um, for a year. I mean, you just, it's, it's miraculous. My dad is a member of the Knights of Columbus and they started doing um, like pancake drives. Um, and my baptismal name is Karen. So they did this cookies for Karen and, and it's funny because at the end of those drives, maybe it's a thousand dollars. And what is a thousand dollars when you're looking at a hundred thousand? But let me tell you, it all makes a difference. And so there'd be this ebb and flow of emotions. Um, I started a blog where I, I just shared with family and friends about the vocational journey. Um, and so like pieces were happening, right? You maybe get a hundred dollar check or, or like a second cousin who's inspired and says, here's a thousand dollars. And it's extremely humbling. Because you're like, what if I don't make it? Have they given this money in vain? And he was like, you got to get over yourself. You just got to trust that the Lord is at work here and accept the goodness of other people. Because one of the miracles of fundraising is that to be the recipient is actually letting someone else participate in the work of God. Because not everyone can do the work physically or emotionally, but there are people who financially can participate. And when we ask them to do that, we let them be benefactors in God's saving mission. So it's I think we forget it's not always a burden. You give your part and then let the Lord do the rest. So these pieces are coming in little by little, but I'm by no means making a big dent, um, right? Because now we're like, so maybe up to 20,000. Well, what do you do with the other 80? Um, and I had been tutoring French on the side. And so this is a neat part of the story. And um, so the Dominican friar that I was tutoring in French, he calls me one day and he said, call back as soon as you can. I think I have a benefactor for you. And, and I say, oh, okay, I call back. And he explains this story of how there is a woman who has recently been away from the Catholic church, who is, is um, seeking kind of reconciliation. She is always kind of just had success with money and wanted to donate and this is the miracle. He said, you know, I'd asked if, if she should donate to the friars, Dominican friars, and he had gotten permission to share her name with me. Cause it's not like the Dominican friars have to raise money too. But, um, so we, we met over dinner and I just shared my life story. And at the end of the dinner, um, she said, I, I want to make this happen. I'm willing to pledge about $40,000. So a woman, I met her over dinner, over dinner. And I just kind of shaking at the thought of this. So here's one of the miracles though. And that woman felt inspired to join Mater Ecclesia Fund for Vocations. And so she not just supported me, but in a bigger way, wanted to continue to support vocations. And so that was a real privilege to introduce her 
to um, to the to your um, apostolate. And so that's that's its own story. So okay, so now I had this other pledge and um, was applying to Mater Ecclesiae. And what I was able to then start to do is say, listen, this much has been paid off by family. This much we've fundraised. This is another verbal pledge by a benefactor. This is how much I'll make in my salary with my second job. And so when you kind of started etching out these little pockets, Mater Ecclesia Fund for Vacations could start to say, okay, now your loans are at a place where we think with our benefactor support, we could cover the difference. Um, and so that's where I was getting to at a point. And I don't, I don't remember exactly when the time was, but there, there was a time when we just got to the part where Mater Ecclesia was able to accept me as a grant recipient and, and cover the remainder, which had, which had been reduced. Um, and so for those of you who maybe don't know how the program works, one of the real gifts of the Mater Ecclesia Fund for Vocations is that they pay your monthly loans while you're discerning. But if you leave, you resume your own payments. And the brilliance of that is it takes away the pressure of obliging someone um, to take over all your loans if it really isn't God's will. Because it happens, some people are called to seminary or to religious life as a discernment, but don't stay. It doesn't mean that they're a failure. It doesn't mean they were wrong. It just meant that whatever God needed for them was a time of formation, but it wasn't the end vocation. Um, and so Mater Ecclesia lets you have the freedom to really discern, knowing that if you leave, it's you don't have to hold your head in shame. You're not a failure. Um, you can just resume your loans. And so that's always understood. And then if you do make final vows, um, the grant program is going to cover, it's going to just continue to cover so that you can keep doing God's, God's will. And so it, it was just a real freedom to know that I didn't feel the pressure. It's not like I have to stay. And there were young women who entered the convent with me who, who didn't stay. And I remember thinking, well, she was really holy. Why did she leave? And then the, the reality is, oh, because she's going to be just fine. I need religious life. The Lord knows I, like, I need a little structure. I need people to check in. And, um, and so I think in all of that, there's just a lot of... Um, opportunities for gratitude and humility and receptivity, um, but also kind of getting over yourself. Like It's okay to let God be God and to let people help you and to accept help and then to just do, do your part. But um, what a miracle. So I was able to enter the convent in August of 2010, been a religious sister now for 11 years. I made final vows in 2017. Um, and it's a real privilege to be able to say before God, um, under the patronage of the Blessed Virgin Mary of our Holy Father, St. Dominic, and in front of all your family and friends um, to say your vows and to say those words for all my life, right? Lord, I'm yours for all my life. Um, but it's, it's this organization that's made that self-gift possible. Um, so lots of, lots of gratitude. Um, and I do pray for this community daily. Um, and will always be very grateful for the role that you've played in my own vocation. So thank you. So I'd like to think that, that my family and friends, you would have persevered in just trying other options. Um, but I will say there, there aren't a lot though. So <laughs> there, there was a lot of hope that the Mater Ecclesi Fund for Vocations, um, I, I mean, if I, had, if I had worked for maybe five more years of the pace I was going with free rent, I might've been able to make more of a dent. Um, but but it, yeah, it's a really hard question to ask because it, it really, in my own story, it, it made all the difference. So I guess I don't like to ask the question, <laughs> what would have happened? So when I was discerning, um, I, I was looking at the Little Sisters of the Poor. And so I'll, I'll explain what the Dominicans do by contrast of another community. The Little Sisters of the Poor have a wonderful apostolate where they, they care for the poor elderly, and especially those nearing death. And I, I loved their community and I was really drawn to how they prayed together. Um, but I remember talking to one of the sisters about, you know, should I be a little sister? And what do you think? And she looked at me point blank and said, do you think you'd like to make beds for the sick and dying for the rest of your life? And I kind of thought about making beds, serving the poor. I thought, I guess I could do it. And she just looked at me and smiled and she goes, yeah, that's really not the right answer. You don't just think I can do it. Your charism is something that kind of makes you come alive. And then she started like kind of smirking as she said to me, and what did you study to teach or to do at CUA? And I said, oh, I studied to be a teacher. And she said, and how did you get to know our community? Oh, I'm a volunteer tutor for the postulants who have to learn French because you're a French order. She goes, huh, and what job are you doing right now? Oh, I just got a job as a teacher with the Dominicans. And it was, she was waiting for me to connect the dots. She goes, I think you have uh, a, a vocation to teach. 
And did you know the Dominicans are teachers? And I looked at her and I said, you're not allowed to say that. Aren't you supposed to be like working for vocations? And she just said, you know what? It's all God's work. And if he wants you to be a little sister, he'll do that. But she's like, I think you need to look more seriously at the Dominicans. So I'm always so grateful to that sister in her just authenticity and understanding more about what a charism was and helps kind of connect dots that would have been really plain for anyone else to see, but I was missing the mark. And so uh, teaching has been something I've wanted to do since I, I was young. And um, that aspect of, of serving through just being with people in the, in the day to day. So Dominicans have a special apostolate where we believe a life of prayer and study becomes nourishing for a life of catechesis. And so teaching can take on all sorts of forms, whether you're physically in a school, whether you're serving in a parish, whether we're doing an adult formation. Um, and so I'm a member of the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia. We're out of Nashville, Tennessee. The congregation was founded in 1860. Um, and so we, we started as a boarding school for young women and then have since then gone at the invitation of bishops to other dioceses, some international um, and many throughout the United States. So I'm serving at St. John Paul the Great Catholic High School in um, Potomac Shores, Virginia. And what's interesting is that this is the school I worked at right away out of college. So I came here in 2008 as a lay teacher. I taught for two years and then in 2015 was sent back to serve as a sister. And then I currently serve as the assistant principal for student life. And so some people ask me, because I'm no longer a teacher in a classroom, do you miss teaching? And do you like your new job? And the answer is yes and yes, right? I'll always miss teaching in a classroom. That's just, I love it. Um, but I, I love my job of service. So serving as an assistant principal, it's not the same as classroom teaching, but I'm still bringing the gospel right to all that I do. And in many ways, those I teach now, it's become broader. I spend more time with parents. I get to work with our faculty formation and I'm still working a lot with students. And so kind of what the teaching looks like might change, but that we are supposed to communicate the love of God and all that we do is kind of our, our day-to-day -day task. How can I, I bring the work asked of me um, and see it all in a supernatural light because um, we, we need to be bringing souls to heaven, primarily concerned too with our own salvation um, and then praying, of course, for the good of souls, glory of God, um, and that we all be one in him. I think it's important to invite and give space. And what I mean by that is if I think there's a young man who might, might have a, a disposition that would just make for a really wonderful priest um, or religious, or if I see a young woman, I think it's important to prayerfully say, okay, Holy Spirit, give me the words and the time to let them know I see that in them. And it can be as simple as, I just want you to know your love of the Lord is really inspiring. Um, have you ever considered a religious vocation? Have you ever considered seminary and, and the priesthood? And if you ever want to talk about it, let me know. I'd be happy to answer questions. And then you give space, right? You let them respond because I think it's important to see it in others, but then to let the Lord work because he's the ultimate vocation director. Um, we're really excited. A, a young man who graduated from our school in 2018 is preparing to enter um, the Dominican Friars this July and has, has shared that with us. And, and there have been other vocations from the school um, so a real gift, but it, it is all a mystery of, of God, but it's even more important than a religious vocation. It's the call to be, you got to be a saint. Um, we need saints in every age. Um, saints are happy, holy people. I love that you use the word joy because when I give, um, shorter vocation talks, I like to use the word joy as just a kind of simple hook on what a vocation looks like, right? It's a call to follow Jesus. So that's your J. <laughs> the O is that it's one done in obedience um, and that the why is, and it's a daily yes. So no matter your vocation, it needs to lead you to joy, right? Um, and that comes from following Jesus's call obediently, but with, with a daily yes. And the yeses we give every day, um, some of those are easier than others, but fidelity is very beautiful to God. Um, and that consistent trust in his will always brings that fruit of joy. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's um, a, very, a very lived experience, the joy of, of Jesus that yes in itself is an act of faith and I do think we have a great example of this in our blessed mother Mary um, she kind of gives us permission and courage to say yes to God's will and I I think when it comes to giving to the Lord whether that's a gift of time whether that's a gift of a particular skill or in this case a gift of finances um, you want the yes to be generous and I think you find generosity when you step just outside your comfort zone so there is, you know, for those of you giving, you do need to think about your own responsibilities that God has entrusted to you. But I also think 
that the Lord is very pleased when we're willing to just step outside the comfort zone. And when we do that, that's actually where growth happens. So the yes of the aspirant, the yes to I'm going to apply to religious life. That means there's a possible they're going to say, no, we don't want you or not this time or not this order. And that's a moment of vulnerability. And I think the same happens for the benefactor, right? When you make that deposit or when you write that check or when you make that family sacrifice to the degree that you're able to go just outside your comfort zone, you become vulnerable for the Lord to show you his power is greater than our masterminding. Um, And so really in all these yeses, whether that's the benefactor, the aspirant, to make a yes in a spirit of prayer. And that's what Mary shows us, right? Be it done to me according to your word. Um, So in a spirit of prayer, we have the grace to say yes in the way God is asking of us and to not compare our yeses with anyone else's. You do not get ahead in the spiritual life by looking at what someone else can give. That is not how God calculates. He goes, did you give what I asked of you? It's just like the woman with the two pence, right? She gave in more than all the others because she gave from her livelihood. Um, and so we, we need to be free from that temptation to compare. Um, if you're giving what God is asking of you, you, you've given what he wanted. Foundation of prayer, keep praying. And even don't underestimate the power of those um, petitions at the daily masses. I started attending daily mass and every time I heard the community pray for an increase in vocations, there was this instant sense of, is everyone looking at me? I think that's supposed to be for me. I wish they'd take that out of the prayers, right? And so just, um, yeah, just that community of prayer supporting it. I think if you're in a parish that doesn't have any literature available, just subscribing to some communities and getting the pamphlets, um, because I know that the print media is maybe not, not as in fashion as other ages, but there is something really nice about seeing the prayer card and taking it home with you and looking at the brochure when no one else is looking. Um, Or if you have access to your parish website, does your parish website have a link for vocational support? So just kind of making it easy for the young people to access what it even looks like. And so that's something the lady can pray, but then they can make it accessible. And then another thing that's very helpful is at the parish setting, or maybe if you work with college or youth ministry to organize chances for religious to come and speak. And so whether your diocese has a vocation awareness week or whether it's even now in this age of Zoom calls, maybe you can't afford to to fly someone in to give a vocation talk, but maybe you ask the youth director or the pastor, what would you feel if we actually had a panel of religious on a Zoom call and and we let them share their vocation stories? So just kind of getting creative with how do you let the meet, the youth meet um, those those, um, already in a a vocation because those stories help the young person think, huh, again, they look happy and maybe that could be me. And so you're planting that seed of possibility. And um, especially for young people who might not have any exposure to to religious life where they they are. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, for all the graces of redemption, Lord, we thank you for the lives of all the saints who inspire us to holiness. Thank you, Lord, so much for the work and ministry of the Madre Ecclesia Fund for Vocations. Please continue to bless all the members of their staff, their benefactors, and those you are calling to join them in this great missionary ministry. Lord, we pray for all the grant recipients that they would persevere in knowing and doing your holy will. We ask, Lord, that this interview would give you honor and glory and draw souls to you. Mother Mary, Mother of the Church, we do ask your intercession and pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.